I also want to make sure that our kids are able to hear from God's word in a way that rings true for them. Um, and so here in just a moment, uh, any kids who are with us four years old through fourth grade, uh, you can find your teacher, Rachel, in the back. She's got a, a lesson prepared just for our young ones, again, four years old through fourth grade. Uh, but before we let our kids go, before we dig into this, uh, let's say a, a prayer over our time in God's word today. Uh, gracious Father, we, we thank you for the gift of, of your word. We thank you for the promise that you will work through that word to shape us, to transform us. And so God, as, as we enter into this season of, of longing and, and expectation, this, this season of, of longing for your per perfect kingdom, that longing for that perfect home that is coming, God, we pray that, that our longing and our waiting, that it would be done anchored in your word that you would sustain us, and that you would prepare us for that future. God, work this in us by the power of your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our friends, you can have a seat, and, and kids, you can find your teacher in the back. Uh, well, friends, it's good to be with you. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Marcus. I serve here as the campus pastor, and uh, thankful that I can uh, share God's word with you this morning and that I get to kick off uh, our Advent sermon series that we've titled, This Must Be the Place, uh, named this one after uh, one of my favorite Talking Head songs. Um, and so for all of the Gen Xers in the room who constantly feel forgotten, this one's for you. All right, guys? All right. Um, so now we're going to forget you again. So no, I'm kidding. We love you. We love you. We love you, Gen X. Um, I want to kick us off this morning uh, by sharing uh, just a, a quick story. So a couple weeks ago, uh, my wife Vanessa and I, we had picked our kids up from school, and we have uh, a son, Jude, who's uh, five years old. He's in kindergarten. Uh, we have a daughter who's eight years old, Della. She's in second grade. And we're, we're driving home, pretty normal, typical afternoon, and, and we pull into our driveway, and, uh, and my son, I hear him from the back seat, he goes, oh, I just love our house. I just love our house. Uh, and it was a really adorable, endearing uh, moment uh, for me as, as a father. Uh, but I, I thought about this, and I reflected upon this, uh, and, and I was sort of struck by the way my son's comment Ah, I just love our house, uh, is juxtaposed uh, against uh, my wife and I uh, and many of the conversations that we have about our house. Because, uh, number one, we're, we're preparing actually for a kitchen remodel and, and trying, to, trying to update and, and improve that, that space a little bit. Uh, and we're immensely grateful for our house. We love the neighborhood that we live in. We, we love where we're located, and, and we're incredibly thankful that, that we uh, were able to, to get our house when we did. But if I'm honest, most of the conversations that we have about our house are about the things we don't like about our house, right? Which I've just come to find out is just sort of what you do when you're in your 30s, right? Is you just, like, complain about, you know, it's like, I want to update this, I want to change that. It would be nice if we had, the, you know... Again, grateful, but again, we're in our 30s, so this is sort of what you do. So welcome, welcome to the life of your millennial pastor. <laughs> but as I thought about my son's comment, ah, I just love our house, it became very clear to me uh, that my son is blissfully unconcerned with things like the amount of square footage of the house that he lives in. He is blissfully unconcerned with what kind of kitchen countertops are in it, blissfully unconcerned with whether or not it has a, a finished basement or, or anything like that, that he just is, doesn't care. Because his love, right, his feeling of, ah, I just love our house, has nothing to do with the house itself. It has everything to do with what he experiences there, with what he feels there in that house. And, and the argument that I want to make, that the case that I want to make throughout this, this sermon series that we're, we're digging into during the season of Advent is that what my five-year-old son has experienced in a 1,500-square-foot ranch in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is actually what every single one of us is looking for. It's what every single one of us is looking for, and that thing is simply home. Home. 
that every single one of us, whether we're looking or whether we realize it or not, we are looking for, searching for something, someone, some place to call home. Uh, the 20th century theologian Henry Nouwen uh, reflects on this reality as he was reflecting on, on this sort of pivotal moment in his own life. If you're not familiar with Henry Nouwen, uh, he was regarded as, as one of the most just kind of accomplished theologians uh, of his day uh, and actually left a, a very flourishing career in academic theology uh, to go and serve in a community called the Ark. Uh, it was a community that was devoted to serving uh, adults uh, with severe uh, disabilities. And he went and he lived in this community, trading, again, the, the, the prestige of his academic theology uh, to live among and, and care for people in great need. And during this time that, that was sort of pivotal in this transition, he reflected and said this, says, for so long I had been going from place to place, confronting, beseeching, admonishing, and consoling. Now I desired only to rest safely in a place where I could feel a sense of belonging, a place where I could feel at home. Now, what he observed that in the midst of all of his accomplishments, all of the work, all of the toil, all of the stuff that he was trying to stack up, what he really longed for at the end of the day was a place of rest, a, a place where he could feel like he belonged. He was longing for a place that he could call home. You see, friends, what, I, what I've come to realize is, is that home is what we're looking for when we do things like trying to present ourselves in a way that others will find acceptable so that they will welcome us, so that we can feel like we belong. What we're looking for in that is ultimately home. That, that home is what we're looking for when we try to stack our achievements up so that others will pat us on the back and say, well done, that we've done enough, that we're good enough, we're looking for, for home. Home is what we are looking for. It's what we're longing for. It's what we're after when we try to buy and consume more and more and more, trying to fill that void that we don't understand just by filling it with all kinds of stuff so that we might feel whole. What we're looking for is home. Home is what we're looking for when we run from relationship to relationship, person to person, hoping that that might, that might bring us the security and belonging that we long for. And the funny thing is, is we spend so much time looking for it in place after place, person after person, thing after thing, that many of us probably find ourselves asking, what is home? And would I even know it if I found it? Would I even know it if I found it? And so as we kick off this series, I want to try to answer this question for us. What is home? And I want to answer it by looking not at things as they are right now, but looking at the future that God has in store for his people that he promised to his people Israel as their home was being destroyed that future of a perfect home. And here's what that future of a perfect home looks like. We find that home is a place of healing, home is a place of abundance, and home is a place of belonging. A place of healing, a place of abundance, and a place of belonging. All right, so that'll be our outline as we get into Isaiah chapter 65 this morning. Uh, go there with me. Isaiah 65, we're gonna pick up at verse 17. Here's what God says through the prophet Isaiah. It says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. So here in Isaiah 65, at the end of this chapter, as, as we're nearing actually the end of the entire prophecy of Isaiah, uh, God gives this vision, this promise of what he is going to do in the future. Now these words are being spoken to a people who are being carried off into exile. 
who have watched the, the land of Israel uh, be overwhelmed by foreign enemies and much of the land being made uninhabitable and the city of Jerusalem being ransacked and destroyed, just utterly laid waste to. And so here, right, as this has come upon the city of Jerusalem, and we see throughout the scriptures that this is coming about ultimately because of Israel's failure, because of their unfaithfulness, because they've wandered off into idolatry, they've begun to exploit one another and exploit those around them. And so instead of Jerusalem being this place of healing and hope where God's love flows out into the world, it's become a place of hurt and harm and destruction. And God says, even in the midst of this, here's this cause for hope. I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And the word for create here is the same word that's used at the beginning of Genesis in chapter 1 when God creates the heavens and the earth. So what God once did in Genesis, he is going to do again for a second time, only this time it is going to be so wonderful, so beautiful that this former creation is not going to be remembered. And it's not because God failed in his creation, but because his creation failed because his creation turned against him. And so when God says through Isaiah that the former things shall be remembered, he's talking about everything that went wrong. Everything from Adam and Eve's failure in the garden, how they turned away and they ate the fruit that God commanded them not to eat. Everything, like Cain and Abel, brother killing brother because of jealousy and envy. Things like what we see in the flood, Humanity turning aside, going their own way. Everything like all of the failures of Israel again and again, generation after generation. The failure of their kings, the failure of their people, the exile, the destruction, all of these things will no longer be remembered. And in place of that, God is going to make Jerusalem once again a place that's filled with joy. God is going to turn their weeping and their sadness into joy and celebration. What was meant to be a place of healing that has become a place of destruction is going to once again be a place of healing. You see, the home that God is preparing for his people there is a place where everything that went wrong in Israel's story is healed and renewed. That Jerusalem is going to be what it was made to be. That Jerusalem was made to be a place where God would come and dwell amongst his people and that through his presence, his healing would flow out into the world. But instead, what we see right now in this moment, as Israel hears this word, it's become a place of weeping, a place of sadness, a place of hurt and pain and destruction. Now, we may not know the the specific experience of, of what Jerusalem was going through, but we know what it's like to endure places that were made to be places of healing but become places of hurt and destruction, right? We know what this is like. Uh, In fact, I I would contend that, that some of the most painful and traumatic experiences in life are actually when places that should be places of home, places of healing, places of safety, instead become places of hurt. Right, like it's one thing to be hurt by someone you expect to hurt you. To be hurt by someone that that you see or, or sees you as an enemy, you expect that. It is an immensely painful experience to be hurt by those that you would run to for healing. Right, this is why, right, familial trauma, right, is so, so difficult to navigate. This is why spiritual trauma and spiritual abuse is is so incredibly harmful because homes and churches, what were they made to be? What does God intend for them to be? Places of safety, places of healing, places of rest and restoration, but the harsh reality of sin means that they are often filled with the same hurt and the same pain as the world around us. So what do we do when places of hurt or places of healing become places of of pain and hurt, places of judgment rather than places of welcome. Turn with me, John chapter 1, 
we actually see here in John's prologue to the life of Jesus, the way Jesus himself experiences this reality, right? John chapter 1, verse 11, he, that is Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, right? Notice what John says here, right? Jesus, when he entered into the world, when God's Son took on humanity, he came to his own. He came to the people who should have known, the people who were waiting, the people who were expecting, and what happened? He was rejected. He was cast aside. He was refused. And it wasn't just the people of Israel, right? He came to his own creation. He became human like us in every way. And what has creation done is creation has said, no thank you. We'd prefer to go our own way. That Jesus enters into this experience of entering into the place that should be his only for what is his, only for his creation to reject, reject him. That Jesus' crucifixion is not simply Israel's rejection of their Messiah. It is creation's rejection and refusal of their Lord and King. But what we're told and what we're reminded of throughout all of Scripture is that Jesus is rejected for your sake. Jesus is rejected so that you might be welcomed. Jesus is cast out so that you might be brought in. Jesus is wounded so that by his wounds you would be healed. And friends, this healing that Jesus comes to bring to the world that is so often filled with hurt, pain, longing, and rejection, friends, this is what God has in store for us in the future. That regardless of the pain and the hurt that you experience right now and regardless of whose hands have caused that pain and that hurt, the hands of Jesus are wounded so that he might bring about your healing, and that's what he's bringing with him in the future. And when he brings that with him, he is going to pour out, he is welcoming you into that kingdom to enjoy the very gracious abundance of our God. Here's what God says next through Isaiah. It says, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands." You know, one of the things that, that I'm struck by here in, in these verses is the way that Isaiah describes this future, new, restored creation is actually very mundane. It's just like, yeah, like children are going to grow up. Okay. <laughs> People are going to build houses. You know what they're going to do? They're going to live in them, right? So, all right, great. They're going to plant vineyards, right? And they're actually going to harvest and, and eat their fruit, right? Like, like this is just sort of like ordinary life, isn't it? But what we notice here is it's ordinary life without the ills that so often plague it. And in particular, it's ordinary life without the ills that are currently plaguing Israel. Is what has happened to the people of Israel in the exile, is their city has become a place of chaos and destruction where children are going without basic provision and their lives are being lost because of the chaos and the warfare. It's a place where they built homes and now they're being carried off into exile as now another nation is coming and occupying their city. They planted vineyards that have been made just sort of unfruitful by the warfare and the chaos that has been sown throughout the region is that everything that they're experiencing right now in this moment is going to be undone. And so what we find here is actually this picture of immense abundance and security. The children are going to grow up. They're going to lead long, full lives. They're going to be provided for and have what they need. People are going to build homes, and they're actually going to live in them. They're going to actually eat of the fruit of their labors. This is a picture of abundance, security, provision. Everyone is going to have what they need. It's going to be protected. It's going to be cared for. 
And because of this abundance, the lives of God's people are going to be safe and at rest. Yet so often what we experience in life is shaped not by this picture of abundance, it's shaped by scarcity and desire. Scarcity and this constant desire for more. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Uh, there's certainly some uh, more economically knowledgeable folks in the room than, than myself. Uh, but see, sort of a basic definition of, of scarcity. Uh, scarcity refers to the most basic economic problem, the gap between limited resources and theoretically limitless wants. Uh, I know I've used this in a sermon before, but I think it speaks very clearly to this picture that we see, right? So scarcity refers to the reality that resources are finite, right? Like I may have a field of, let's say, coffee, right? That's a finite amount of coffee that I can produce. Theoretically, everyone could want that coffee all the time. So how do I sort of bridge that gap, right? Do I ration it out to people? Do I sell it at a fair market price, right? This is sort of the fundamental problem, right, that economies are are trying to solve and address. And so this reality of scarcity means, right, that there is always going to be this sort of lingering fear that resources are going to be limited, that there's not going to be enough to go around, But not only do we end up having these sort of limitless wants and desire for the things that we need, we end up growing and desiring things that we don't even need. Uh, The social philosopher Rene Girard says it like this. He says, man is the creature who does not know what to desire, and he turns to others in order to make up his mind. We desire what others desire because we imitate their desires. Uh, This is a form of desire uh, typically referred to as this idea of mimetic desire. I know Pastor Gabe's talked about this before. Uh, It's basically sort of philosophical for like keeping up with the Joneses, right? Like I want a boat. Why do I want a boat? Not because I love the water, because my neighbor has a boat, right? My neighbor wants a boat and I want what my neighbor has and therefore I want a boat, right? Now notice the way that these two things can work together, right? So we have on the one hand, resources are scarce, they're finite, they're limited. And so that limit, that finite reality of resources, it creates this, cultivates this fear that we may not have enough. And so do we do. Well, I got to grab and I got to get what I can get while I can, because you never know, right? The well may dry up. And so I've got to store it up. I've got to save for that rainy day. But not only do we have that desire to accrue the things that we actually need, we have countless voices around us, not just our literal neighbors, but the constant voices of marketing and advertising that are saying, buy this, get that, accrue that, this product will make your life better, easier, simpler, you'll be happier. And all of these voices serve to create an ever-increasing number of desires so that we want not only the very things that we need, we want even more than that. And the more that we get proves not to satiate and satisfy those desires, but it actually serves only to increase those desires. You want a perfect example of this? Uh, Could I get that picture? All right. So this sneaker, right? You look at that, right? It's like, okay, it's a gray Nike sneaker. So this sneaker uh, is actually a very, has a very infamous backstory. Uh, So this is a a Nike SB Dunk. Uh, It was created in collaboration uh, with a New York City designer by the name of Jeff Staple. Uh, And this is commonly referred to as the pigeon dunk, right? And so people like, you know, who love sneakers, right? You talk about pigeon dunk, right? Like they'll be like, all right, here we go. Uh, So again, there's a very infamous backstory, right? So this was created with this designer and it was released in his storefront in New York City. That was the only place that you could get it. It was made in very limited quantities. So people were lining up for days uh, just to get their hands on this sneaker. Uh, there were riots that broke out over getting this. I, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. This is a true story, right? Riots breaking out to get this sneaker. Uh, in fact, police showed up and were actually escorting the people who were able to purchase this sneaker uh, out of the store to make sure that they didn't get mobbed and, and mugged on the way out and have it taken from them. Right? Now, this sneaker, when it sold, retailed for $200, right? And you may hear that and you're like, that's absurd, right? $200, like, is there like gold in the insoles or what? Like, you don't know how much it would cost you to buy this sneaker today? You don't know? 
$40,000. $40,000, right? Like, so you could buy a Toyota or this sneaker, right? Like down payment on a house or a Nike Pigeon Dunk, right? Like really, you know, it's kind of a toss up, right? We just kind of gotta, kinda gotta weigh it out here, right? 40,000, why? Why? It's because of scarcity and, and desire, right? Limited number of these ever made and a very small number of voices of these sort of in-crowd tastemakers saying that this is cool and therefore if you have it, then, then you're sort of part of the in-crowd whether or not you actually like the sneaker is sort of irrelevant, right? If you have it, then you're in the know, you're part of the in crowd, right? Invented, manufactured desire for something that ultimately is rather superfluous. Scarcity and desire. Compare that with the reality that we see spring forth in the early church. Acts chapter 4, here's what we encounter. Acts 4, verse 32, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Why did this reality spring forth? The reason this reality sprang forth is because the earliest Christians believed that in Jesus they had encountered the manifestation of the abundance of God. That they looked upon the outpouring of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And they said, if God would do this, if God could forgive like this, why would we withhold anything? Why would we withhold anything? What if we learned, friends? What if we learned to see what we have not as scarce resources to hoard, but as manifestations of the abundance of our God? As outpourings of God's abundance, the same God who gave the life of his own son, Jesus Christ. Basil the Great said it like this, convert your wealth into a truly inseparable adornment. Keep everything with you when you go. Be persuaded to this by Christ, the good counselor who loves you. He became poor for us so that he might make us rich through his poverty. Friends, when we encounter the abundance of our God in Jesus Christ, we don't have to settle for a life that is shaped by scarcity and endless desire. This doesn't mean that you'll get everything that you want. It means that we can learn to hold what we have, not with tight fists, but with open hands, trusting that these are expressions of God's gracious abundance. Trusting that God has already provided everything we need and more, and trusting that he has a future in store for us that will be lived in that gracious abundance poured out for us in Jesus. And we can, we can trust that. We can believe that because what God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ, that what he wants above all else is he simply wants to be with us. He simply wants to be with us. Isaiah chapter 65, it ends like this. Verse 23 they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. 
So it's worth uh, noting here uh, that in verse 23, when it talks about they shall not labor in vain uh, or bear children for calamity, uh, this is actually a direct reversal of the curse of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Right, the language of, of pain and childbearing is, is not necessarily referring to, to sort of physical pain, uh, but the sort of the reality and the conditions of bearing and raising children, uh, that it's often going to be a, a work of toil and, and labor, and there's going to be fear, and there's going to be anxiety surrounding it. And also the, the toil and the backbreaking labor, right? So this here, right, the promise is in that future, that new heavens, that new earth, this curse is going to be reversed. It's going to be undone. And notice why it's going to happen. Notice why this curse is going to be undone. For, or in other words, because they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. Because they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. The future home that God has in store for his people is one in which their relationship with him is restored. And it is the restoration of that relationship that begins to undo the curse of sin. And as a result of this, we see later in the text, right, they're so in tune with God that before they even call out to him, God answers. Before they even speak, he hears them. And in addition to this, relationships between adversaries are restored, right? The wolf and the lamb begin to graze together. There's no more fighting. Relationships with one another are healed because our relationship with God is healed. And so what we can sort of deduce from this is that all of these promises that God is speaking here about this perfect home that he has in store for his people is ultimately an outgrowth of a restored relationship between God and his people. In other words, the greatest gift that God offers to us is that we belong to him. And when we belong to him, all of this healing, all of this abundance simply flows as outgrowths of that. Which I believe makes what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 4, all the more profound when he says, abide in me and I in you. The word abide here is the Greek word meno, which abide, remain, it could be dwell, take up residence, Make your home in me, Jesus says, and I'll make my home in you. You see, friends, the, the gift of the gospel is ultimately this, is that in the midst of all of our searching for something or some place to call home, home has come to find you. Home has come to find you, and in that we discover that home is not a place. Home is not a thing that we experience once we've accomplished every single goal in life. Home is not something we get when we have the perfect house in the perfect neighborhood with all the right square footage and filled with all the right stuff. Home is a person. Home is God's son who has come in love to find you. Home is God's son with his arms stretched out on a cross so that he might bring you back to himself. Home is this Jesus risen from the dead who stretches out his nail-pierced hands, who says, peace be with you. Welcome home. Let's pray. Father, as St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they come to rest in you. God, we go through life searching for something to call home, some place that we can belong. And in Jesus, you have come and you have invited us to find our home in you. And so, Father, we pray that, that you might give us rest through this promise. That as we look to the future that you have in store for us, that we might find hope in the promise that you are right now with us, that we already belong to you. 
And Father, as we seek to find our home in you, we pray that you would also work in and through us by the power of your spirit that we would throw open the doors of your home to the world around us, that we would welcome others into the promise of your kingdom, that we might, by proclaiming the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness that you have poured out in Jesus, that we might say to the world, come, find peace, find rest, come to this Jesus, welcome home. God, work this in us, by the power of your spirit, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.